name's Lindsay, and this is Weird. Weirdos! It's episode five of Weird, a podcast of curiosities. I've really been looking forward to this for a few days. One, because what I have lined up for What's Weird this week had me giggling, but also we're going to talk about Richard Ramirez. I had promised you that we would talk about how he got caught because it really is kind of a legendary story and it's certainly one of my favorites. So I'm going to make good on that promise today. We are returning to the grim world of serial killers for this episode, and I do want to offer a word of caution, however. There's some pretty nasty stuff in this episode, so please, please exercise discretion while listening. Richard was indiscriminate when it came to his victims, and he was also horrifyingly sadistic. So fellow weirdos, If you're at all sensitive to graphic material, please be considerate to yourself as needed. He was truly the stuff of nightmares. He became the reason people left their lights on at night, the reason they locked their doors, the reason their hearts would race upon hearing the things that go bump in the night. So I'd like to open with a quote from a documentary about Richard Ramirez uh, that I thought was particularly interesting, especially in Richard's case. And it's, it's simply this. People don't think that serial killers were ever children. At some point, we disconnect these offenders from their childhood, when in fact their childhood may have had everything to do with who they've become, just as your childhood influences and shapes who you are, as does mine. And I I don't say this as a way to try and excuse anything. Please don't misinterpret me. I say it because... I I try to understand how somebody got to where they are. I try and understand the path that they went down. This path would eventually land Richard on death row. He was born February 29th, 1960 in El Paso, Texas. He was the youngest of five children, Reuben, Joseph, Robin, and Ruth. While pregnant, his mother, Mercedes, she worked at a shoe factory and she had to use heavy chemicals and things like that, but there was no ventilation and she didn't have a face mask. So as a result, sadly, two of Richard's older siblings, Reuben and Joseph, were born with birth defects. Richard also suffered two severe head injuries as a child. Uh, The first one was when he was two years old, a dresser fell on him. And when he was five years old, he was hit in the head by a swing set. That was in 1965. And both events knocked him unconscious and he did require stitches. He also had to cope with epileptic seizures up until he was about 15 years old as a result of being hit in the head. I do want to touch on these head injuries for a quick minute. And this is going to seem like a tangent and I promise it it isn't. Well, it is, but it isn't because it it really does relate very much to Richard's case specifically. It's entirely possible for head injuries such as these to cause changes in behavior and personality. The most famous case, and you may have heard of it, is that of Phineas Gage. In 1848, Phineas sustained a serious head injury when an iron crowbar smashed through his skull and penetrated his prefrontal cortex. Prior to the injury, Phineas had been law-abiding, respectable, and responsible. After the injury, though, he became impulsive, irresponsible, even abusive. Many of the traits associated with psychopathy. Evidence is showing that damaging events to the brain, such as injuries and even strokes, can cause a shift towards psychopathic traits. Neuroscientists have made significant strides in studying the brain and its relationship to psychopathy. There's an incredible book, and this is my book recommendation for the week, by Dr. Kent Keel. It's called The Psychopath Whisperer, and it details his research and the subsequent 
findings of this astounding research. And to sum it up, he took thousands of inmates, who, all of whom had been diagnosed with psychopathy, and he conducted MRI scans on them. And the long and the short of it is that inmates who were diagnosed with psychopathy were revealed to have deficits in the paralimbic cortex of the brain. This part of the brain moderates things like self-control and emotional processing. Now, if you're like me and you're wondering about Dr. Keel's qualifications, you should check out his website at uh, kentkeel.com. That's K-E-N-T-K-I-E-H-L.com. Seriously, the word count of his peer-reviewed credits is longer than most novels. Notably, he was co-mentored by, see if you recognize this name, Dr. Robert Hare. He's the creator of the Hare Psychopathy Checklist, who we talked about in episode one about Clifford Olson. So all that to say, Dr. Keel knows his shit. And if you're interested in the field of neuroscience and psychopathy, then his research is an excellent place to start. So the reason I bring all of that up is because there's a real possibility that the injuries Richard sustained contributed to his callous and unemotional traits. That said, these injuries occurred when he was two years old and five years old. The onset of his troubling behavior began as he entered adolescence. So the question that I'm still mulling over is whether or not pseudopsychopathy or psychopathy can remain latent or have a delay in taking effect for years after the initial injury. I'm still researching that answer, so if any of you happen to know neuroscientists, I would absolutely love their input on this. Something else that Dr. Keel has noted is that although physical damage to the brain, like we mentioned, like uh, injuries and strokes and whatnot, can cause psychopathic sy symptomatology, that kind of damage rarely results in goal-directed aggression, which is a trait found in most psychopaths. So essentially what I'm getting at here is that his head injuries may or may not have had anything to do with the development of his behavior, so it warrants further investigation. If you look at photos of Richard as a child, he had these big brown eyes and he was completely adorable, as many children are at that age. He had friends, he was well liked, he did well in school, and by all accounts he was known simply to be nice. Richard's mother, when asked what he was like as a child, said, when Richie was a little boy, he used to love to dance to the radio. She described him as a happy child who loved to laugh and who was outgoing. Now, although his childhood has been characterized as a happy one, his father, Julian, was also said to have had a violent temper and beat his children with a belt. Despite this, though, he was very close with his sister and with his mother, and by all accounts, his mother was a loving and kind figure in his life. Additionally, Richard's brothers, due to their birth defects, they had been put into a special needs class. And it's worth noting here that Richard had often actually protected his brothers from bullies at school as well. His brothers were put into this special needs class, but the teacher, it so happens, ugh, was a pedophile. While Richard's parents were away from the house, this teacher would come over and he would abuse the boys. Richard was eight or nine at the time, and although he does deny ever being molested himself, his brothers maintain that they believe Richard was absolutely abused by this teacher. It wasn't long after this that Richard began to sniff glue and use marijuana, uh, an example set to him by his brothers. At the age of 11 or 12, Richard began to spend time with Miguel, a.k.a. Mike. Miguel was his older cousin, and he was also a Vietnam War vet. And he wasn't just any Vietnam War vet. He was a decorated war hero, and he was also a Green Beret. Mike exposed Richard to photos that he took while in Vietnam of women he had raped, tortured, and murdered. He would tie these women to trees, he would brutalize them, he would torture them, he would rape them, he would decapitate them, and he would photograph them. And he had a shoebox full of these pictures. This was a pivotal time for Richard. 
psychologically much of how we perceive sex and our, and our own sexuality is shaped during adolescence. Richard himself stated during an interview that the, the onset of his fascination with murder and crime developed around the age of 12 or 13, which it's no surprise since it was around that time he witnessed Mike murder his wife with a 38 that he kept in the fridge. Richard never told his parents about what he saw. Mike was sent to a mental hospital after being declared insane for the murder of his wife. But now... In Richard's mind, sex, violence, murder, they're all intertwined. Already, adolescence is such a critical period when we're highly susceptible to learning. Add to that someone that Richard looks up to, a role model, a fucking decorated war hero. Not only showing Richard these photos, but actively encouraging that behavior. In addition, Mike taught Richard his techniques for moving about in the forest undetected. Techniques that Richard would utilize as he evolved from Richie, the happy child who loved to dance, into the hideous Night Stalker. It was around this time that Richard became a peeping Tom as well. Personally, I think the term makes the act sound more innocent than it actually is. Peeping sounds kind of coy and cute, but it isn't. It's insidious and it's alarming and people shouldn't do it. Just don't do it. There's an entire history behind the term peeping Tom, which it involves Lady Godiva and taxes and all this kind of thing. But we'll talk about that some other time, maybe. I'll leave you in suspense for now. So Richard began sleeping in cemeteries to escape his father's temper, which is where he allegedly began to pray to the devil. Now, there is part of me that wonders if the devil worshipping angle was formulated by Richard just for the spectacle of it. Satanic panic was on the rise after the 1980 book release of Michelle Remembers. The book was written by psychiatrist Lawrence Pazer and his patient, who would later become his wife, Michelle Smith. It was this book that really kicked off Satanic Panic, and that was the fear of Satanic cults conducting dark rituals involving children and sexually abusing them and all these other terrifying, awful things. And as a result, the children would repress these traumatic memories, and the only way to recover the memories was to go through these certain psychiatric techniques. The book was later hugely discredited, but the damage had been done. People were terrified of rock music, of Dungeons and Dragons, and anything remotely resembling Satan, the devil, the occult witchcraft, anything like that. And not to get off on too much of a rabbit trail here, but Satanism, as in the Church of Satan, is not the same as devil worship or as witchcraft or as Wicca. These things are different and the terms shouldn't really be used interchangeably as many folks do it's sort of a pet peeve of mine like any religion there's nuances and fringe groups and conservative groups and liberal groups and richard wasn't associated with a specific church or faction of satanism he acted alone and he lived to serve the devil or so he claims anyway he did visit a satanic group while in San Francisco at one point, but he decided it wasn't really for him and he continued to operate in kind of his own twisted way. Okay, so as I said, people were already kind of palpably terrified of Satan. So confessing that the devil is your master and other such nonsense to me seems like an easy way to invoke fear and to get attention at the same time, which is what Richard thrived off of. And the thing is, we only have Richard's integrity to rely on for information about this. We only know he was praying to the devil in cemeteries because he told us he was praying to the devil in cemeteries. And if you watch interviews with him, so much of what he says, though actually kind of eloquent, feels really rehearsed and kind of scripted. So I'm not saying it's impossible he sincerely worshipped the devil, but I don't know, given his glibness, his grandiosity, I just, I wouldn't put it past him to exaggerate that just to add to that whole sort of rock star persona. Equally, and I think this is really an important point, he was raised as a strict Catholic. So it would make sense to him 
that the devil is the ultimate evil because that's what he would have been raised with. So of course that's what he would use to try and terrify people. Okay, so let's look at what we've got going on so far. There's been child abuse, drug abuse. He witnessed a violent crime. He was exposed to graphic sexual violence from a role model at an impressionable age. There's the alleged molestation, the possible brain damage from his mother's pregnancy when she was working in the shoe factory, and of course the possible brain damage from his childhood head, head injuries, all before the age of 15. Eventually, Richard dropped out of high school and he began to work at a Holiday Inn. He had an all-access key, which he of course used to his advantage. He would hide in rooms, he would watch women as they undressed, and he would steal money and possessions. It didn't take long, however, for this behavior to escalate. Richard attacked a woman from behind as she was getting out of the shower, but as he was raping her, her husband returned to the room and beat the shit out of him. He did get arrested, but the couple, they lived out of state and they didn't want to come back to testify. They just kind of wanted to put the whole thing behind them. So the charges ended up being dropped. When Richard was 17, good old cousin Mike returns to the scene after having been released from the mental hospital. They would talk about violent sex and use cocaine together. Again, reaffirming that sex violence correlation that was already in Richard's brain. A year later, he moved to LA and he developed a $1,500 a week cocaine habit, which he funded by breaking into houses and cars. He was arrested, fingerprinted, and imprisoned for six months after being caught stealing a car. He was released in June of 1984, which is when he began killing and shit really hit the fan. So this brings us to 79-year-old Jenny Vinkow. Richard had intended to burglarize her glassal apartment, but instead he ended up stabbing her repeatedly and he slashed her throat so deeply that he nearly decapitated her. She was discovered by her son, June 28th, 1984. He had removed the screen of a window in order to access the home and unwittingly left a nice juicy fingerprint for law enforcement to find. Another fingerprint had been found on the victim's body as well. So in 1984, fingerprints could only be used to connect a suspect to a crime after the suspect had already been identified. There were about 6 million fingerprints on file with the Department of Justice, which really isn't all that many. A computerized fingerprinting system was in the process of being developed, and although it wasn't operational yet, it would play a key role in this case later on down the road, so we will circle back to that later. I'll quickly note here that most of the sources I read stated that Jenny Vinko was his first victim. However, there were a couple sources that stated his first murder was a nine-year-old who was found in the basement of the Cecil Hotel where he lived in LA. I have not been able to fully confirm this, however. As well, in 2009, DNA evidence surfaced that connected him to the 1984 rape and murder of another nine-year-old San Francisco girl. March 17, 1985, Richard saw Maria Hernandez while on the freeway and began to follow her. He stalked her as she turned off the freeway, as she drove down her street, as she approached her own home, and as she pulled into her driveway. She parked in her garage, and as the door came to a rumbling close, Richard attacked. He attempted to shoot her, but Maria deflected the bullet with her keys like fucking Wonder Woman. She fell to the ground, and she played dead. Ramirez, believing he had killed her, entered the apartment with the intent of burglarizing it. Sadly, Maria's roommate, Dale, she was home and she heard the gunshot and she crouched behind the counter, of course, terrified. However, after a while, she did poke her head up to see what was happening and Richard spotted her and shot her and she didn't survive. Maria managed to see Richard's face as he fled the scene, which led to an initial composite drawing of his face. Now, later that same night, Richard spotted Veronica Yu while on the freeway. He began to follow her, 
But after a while, Veronica decided that she wasn't having any of this stalkery bullshit and pulled over. She asked Ramirez why he was following her and Ramirez proceeded to fatally shoot her and then disappear into the night. However, he did leave some vital information behind. The bullet casings recovered at both crime scenes were discovered to be a match. So it didn't take long for law enforcement to realize that they were dealing with the same person and that they had a serial killer on their hands. Days later, March 28th, 1985, Ramirez slipped unnoticed into the home of Maxine and Vincent Zazara. After trying all the doors and windows and finding they were locked, he discovered a small window which led to the laundry room. Silently, stealthily, he made his way inside, taking off his shoes so he wouldn't be detected as he moved through the dark house. Ramirez found Vincent in front of the television where he had fallen asleep. He shot Vincent in the head, instantly killing him. His wife, Maxine, heard the shot and she tried to flee from the house. Ramirez caught her, tied her up, and then began going through the house looking for money and valuables. Maxine, the fucking hero, manages to free herself and she went for the shotgun that they kept under the bed. The gun, however, wasn't loaded and Ramirez ended up shooting her as well. And not only that, he shot her three times and then he proceeded to remove her eyes with a butcher knife. A few days later, on May 14th, Richard made his way to Monterey Park to the home of William and Lillian Doy, 66 and 56, respectively. Richard entered the home where he mortally shot William in the face as he went for his handgun, and then he went on to beat the dying man until he lost consciousness. He later died in hospital. Lillian was restrained by Ramirez using thumb cuffs. He savagely raped her. He ransacked the house. However, Lillian survived the ordeal and was able to give a detailed description of Ramirez's appearance. She described him as a tall Hispanic man dressed in black with bad teeth. And it's worth noting here that Richard lived almost exclusively off of sugar. So his teeth were essentially rotting out of his head and his breath was rancid. Like you could smell him coming before he entered the room almost. He also left a clear footprint at the scene, which gave law enforcement clues about his height, his weight, and of course, the brand of shoe he was wearing. By the end of the month, Ramirez would strike again, this time in Burbank. Poor Carol Kyle, 41, was raped and sodomized May 30th, 1985. June 1st. And this one, I don't know, this one really struck a nerve with me. There were two sisters living together. Mabel Bell, she was known as Ma, she was 84. And then Florence Ling, she was 81. She was also known as Nettie. They lived together in their Monrovia home. Richard broke into the house and he found a hammer in the kitchen, uh, which he used to bludgeon Mabel with. He uh, then proceeded to shock her with an electrical cord. He raped Florence and he drew a pentagram on her thigh using her sister's lipstick. He also drew one on the wall of one of the bedrooms. It took two days for the women to be found and they were comatose but alive. Tragically, Mabel eventually succumbed to her injuries and passed away. I don't know, there was, there's something about this one that made me so sad. They, they all make me sad. I, I don't feel, you know, fully disconnected from any of these victims. There's always that empathy that's there. But this one, I just, I picture these two sisters, they're elderly and they're just, they're taking care of each other in their golden years and they're keeping each other company, helping each other through life, just trying to enjoy sort of the, the, the final years that they're going to have together, helping each other along and then in walks this man into their space and just brutalizes them in every way. And then to have one of them pass away like that, leaving the other one alone and traumatized, it just, I don't know, you guys, that one really got to me. So we're gonna move on. The following day, June 2nd, Richard broke into Ruth Wilson's Burbank home via the puppy door. He 
managed to stick his arm through and reach up and unlock the door. He woke Ruth, 41, and took her to the room of her 12-year-old son. He repeatedly sodomized Ruth while her son was locked in the closet and ordered her not to look at him or he'd cut her eyes out. Over the next two months, Ramirez continued his killing frenzy using all manner of methods. And this gets pretty bad weirdos, so just a, just a heads up. He bludgeoned 75-year-old Mary Louise Cannon to death with a lamp. He beat 16-year-old Whitney Bennett with a tire iron and then strangled her with a telephone cord. When the cord began to spark, Ramirez fled the scene believing that Jesus Christ had intervened, saving the victim's life. Whitney required four feet of sutures to mend her scalp of the damage that Ramirez inflicted. Next, he stomped 61-year-old Joyce Lucille Nelson to death, leaving a shoe print of blood on her face. The same night he attacked Joyce, he moved on to 63-year-old Sophie Dickman. He subdued her using a gun, he handcuffed her, stole her jewelry, and forced her to swear on Satan that she had told him the location of all the valuables in the house. So this brings us to July 20th. He invaded the home of Maxon and Leela Needing. He hacked away at them with a machete before fatally shooting them both. He got impatient and bored with the machete and so just shoots them, kills them, but then he continues to hack away at them. He robbed the house as usual and then he headed to the home of the Covenant family. He immediately shot Chenarong Covenant in the head and then repeatedly raped his wife, Somkid. He savagely beat her, raped her, after having restrained their eight-year-old boy. Ramirez again burglarized the house and then demanded that Somkid swear to Satan that she wasn't hiding any valuables. At this point, he also raped the young boy and then he calmly left the scene. A couple weeks later, he headed to Diamond Bar to the home of Elias Oboath. Ramirez silently entered the home and shot Elias while he slept. He raped his wife several times. He robbed the house. And then he stopped to eat a melon from the fridge before walking away into the night. He then found his way to San Francisco where he murdered a Taiwanese couple, Peter and Barbara Pan. Word of the murders got back to the detectives in LA who had been handling the case. Frank Salerno and Gil Carrillo, who, noting the similarities between the murder of the Pans and the murders in LA, promptly made their way to San Francisco. Unfortunately, the mayor of San Francisco at the time released the information regarding Ramirez's footprints to the public in a press conference. As a result, Ramirez casually walked onto the Golden Gate Bridge and tossed his gun and the shoes into the bay. After this, he stole a car and he made his way down to Orange County. Oh, we're getting close to the end of the atrocities, weirdos. It's not going to be this bleak forever, I promise. August 24th, 1985. Ramirez commits what would be his final murder. He broke into the Mission Viejo home of Bill Carnes and his fiancée, Inez Erickson. He shot and killed Bill and raped his fiancée. After he left the home, he made a critical error without realizing it. After fleeing the scene, he abandoned his stolen car and took a bus to Arizona. However, there was a witness who noticed Ramirez driving by. And thinking he looked a lot like the composite sketch that had been plastered everywhere, the witness had the presence of mind to take down the license plate number and report it. It wasn't long before the police were able to find the stolen car that Richard had abandoned. By this time, the fingerprinting system I had mentioned earlier, yay, the fingerprinting system, was operational, and law enforcement were able to collect a print from the stolen car. Always wipe down the rear view mirror, people. Although I'm very thankful that Richard did not do that. Uh, they ran it through the database. There was a match. 
They had Ramirez's prints on file from when he stole the car in 1984. They now had a face and a fucking name to match these horrific crimes. Consequently, his face and name were everywhere. Every magazine, every newspaper, every newscast, pamphlet, posters, everyone was looking for this guy. So, for whatever reason, on August 31st, 1985, Richard decides to come back to California from Arizona. Oh, and this is my favorite part. This is what we've been waiting for. Okay, he arrived at a bus depot only to see the place crawling with police. He decided to try and keep his cool, so he went to go buy some coffee at a grocery store or a shop. But there was a woman, and this woman recognized him. So she starts looking at him, and then she starts pointing at him, and then she starts screaming, El Matador! El Matador! Which translates as the killer. At this point, he starts to lose it. So he tries to escape on a bus. However, the people on the bus also recognized him. And so they start yelling and pointing at him as well. So he gives up on the bus idea and just starts legging it down the street. At this point, he attempted to steal a car. But by this time, people knew who he was and where he was. So everybody kind of starts pooling around and they're getting closer and they're closing in on him. So all these concerned citizens everywhere are pointing and they're yelling and the police have been called and literally 40 police cars and seven helicopters show up on the scene. So he forgets the car. He, there's no way he's getting away with stealing this car. So he continues to run. But now he's being pursued by an angry mob. He sees a woman in a car and tries again to steal it. He pulls her out of the car because I guess stealing the car the first time didn't work out. Maybe second time's the charm. I don't know. Her husband saw what was happening, comes running up behind him and fucking hits him on the back of the head with a pipe. So now he's running down the street with a head injury. There's 40 police cars, seven helicopters, and an angry mob chasing after him, screaming, El Matador. And it sounds like something out of Grand Theft Auto. Allegedly, at one point, he was assaulted with barbecue utensils while cutting through someone's backyard. So this mob of 100 people manages to catch him, and they start beating the absolute shit out of him. The police catch up with the mob and they have to save Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, from being pulverized by all these people. Police, after taking him into custody, were able to recover bullets linking him to some of the murders. And back in El Paso, they found 375 pieces of jewelry that Richard had sent home to his family, jewelry that had belonged to his victims. During the legal proceedings, Richard would stir up a frenzy by flashing pentagrams or yelling things like Hail Satan. And part of me still thinks that's all bullshit just to get everyone in a giant tizzy because he thrived off of that. But again, I don't know. Due to red tape and general tomfuckery, Ramirez didn't actually go to trial until January 30th, 1989. In the meantime, he had developed quite the fan club some women regarded him more as a rock star rather than a serial killer and they would show up in court they would write him letters and they dress in a way they thought he'd like all that kind of thing you get the idea as a result though he managed to get married in 1996 although they did divorce in 2013 the trial itself was extremely unpleasant to say the least Many of the jurors struggled with insomnia and nightmares due to the vicious and graphic nature of what they were being presented with every day. One day, a juror named Phyllis Singletary didn't show up for the trial. She was later found dead in her home, having been shot. Of course, there's no way it could have been Richard, but this instilled a sense of fear fear amongst the jurors regardless. It, it was determined that Phyllis had been shot by her boyfriend, but the widespread sense of panic was not alleviated. One of the jurors, in fact, reported that due to the disturbing nature of the trial, she invested in a guard dog and bars on her windows. 
Ramirez would wear all black and dark sunglasses to court and he would often smirk at the victims and their families. He'd giggle as photos and evidence were submitted. I, I did watch an interview with him and I put the link in the show notes and you can find it on YouTube. And the interviewer asks him, you know, why did you do this? Why did you hurt these people? And he just, he gets this sly, knowing grin on his face. It's absolutely chilling. He was ultimately convicted of 13 counts of murder, five counts of attempted murder, 11 counts of sexual assault, and 14 counts of burglary, although he likely did kill more people than that. He was found guilty September 20th, 1989, and given 19 death sentences. Upon being sent to death row, Richard quipped, Big deal, death always went with the territory. See you in Disneyland. Richard would not live to see his sentence carried out, however. He died in San Quentin of liver failure caused by complications from B-cell lymphoma, June 7th, 2013. Thus concludes the odious tale of the Night Stalker, El Matador, Richard Ramirez. Oh, weirdos, that was a big one. I think we could do with a little bit of what's weird this week. Well, I will tell you what is weird this week. Canadian police in Vancouver and Halifax have found themselves in a bit of a shitty situation. A porta potty arsonist has been operating in the downtown Vancouver area, while in Halifax, a thief has made off with a porta potty from a northeast Halifax work site. Police believe that they have a serial arsonist on their hands in Vancouver, but the great crapper caper of Nova Scotia is likely a timely coincidence. Vancouver police are advising work sites to hide their porta potties overnight and store the hand sanitizer and toilet paper indoors until they can sniff out the offender. Meanwhile, Halifax law enforcement stated that they hope to flush out the culprit, but have found it challenging because they simply have nothing to go on. Good luck, law enforcement. I hope you catch your culprit. Thanks again, weirdos, for tuning in. If you enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to hear more, please rate, subscribe, and review on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Google Play. The links are up on the website, theweirdpod.com, and you can also find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at theweirdpod. If you've experienced something weird or strange or bizarre yourself, by all means, drop me a line. I'd love to hear from you. I'll be back next week with more tales of the bizarre and the curious. In the meantime, remember, stay weird.